So let me welcome you all again. I'm still Stacy Wallach, and this is an OLLI course on Vietnam, class number three. And we are actually getting towards the point where the Americans are involved. Uh, class number four and five will be uh, about the American, uh, the major American involvement. And then class number six is going to be a little bit about what happened after we left in 1973 and the South Vietnam regime fell in 1975. And what's happened in Vietnam since 75 is both horrifying and astonishing. And you could argue now has the beginning of a happy ending, depending on your point of view. So we're going to focus, let me step out of the way here. We're going to focus on the beginning of our involvement. Uh, last week we mentioned that we were already supporting the French during their war, uh, but that was indirect. Well, it wasn't so indirect. We were supplying them with the money, the arms, and uh, uh, that's pretty direct. But we, weren't, we didn't have boots on the ground. Uh, but now, uh, we're going to look very closely today uh, at why the decision, how and why the decision was made to get in. And it's pretty subtle, actually. Um, there were a million books written about the Vietnam War before historians really focused in on what I just said. Now let's start with a map. Uh, and here's Ho Chi Minh City in Cochin, China, this portion, the, uh, the um, Delta region, which is so important in South Vietnam. Here's Da Nang and Hue, because this part, what the French called Annam, uh, is the central portion. And then up here with Hanoi uh, is Tonkin, the uh, northern portion. And there, of course, is a tiny bit of China. And you can see uh, the rest of it. And uh, just a quick reminder, it's about 1,000 miles from top to bottom. Uh, and in those days, you know, in 1954, uh, it took a while to get from the top to the bottom, depending on whether you flew, took the train. The French built a railroad from Hanoi to Saigon. Uh, and when it was not bombed to pieces, it was actually a pretty good railroad. Or you could fly. Uh, so, uh, but walking took a while. And we're going to start with the Geneva Conference, which uh, was pretty remarkable. The, uh, the building was built by the Swiss at their expense to house the League of Nations after uh, World War I. And clearly from the size, they expected big things from the League. Uh, we don't have to go any further in that direction. And this wonderful sculpture, which really is wonderful, uh, was donated by the Woodrow Wilson Foundation of the United States uh, in honor of his failed uh, dream of having the United States lead the world uh, in peace. Oh, a flash quiz. Why did the Geneva Conference start on two different dates, April 26 and May 8? It started on two different dates. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I love it. Right. The Jewish calendar, right. And why did it end on two different dates, July 20 and July 21? That, there were no Jewish holidays around that time. Well, you have to go back to a few months to uh, the uh, Berlin conference in January, February, uh, which was the big four foreign ministers. Now, Here's another part of the flash quiz. So who is the foreign minister? Not the formal title, of course. In the United States, we call it the Secretary of State. Who is the uh, foreign minister for the United States? Dulles. Dulles. Right. How about for Great Britain? OK, that's right. Anthony Ian, right there, right there. How about for France? They actually called him the foreign minister. Hmm? He took on the role, 
but not at the beginning of the conference. You're, you're not wrong, but not at the start of the conference. Anybody? Georges Bidot, who we'll meet in a moment. And how about for the Soviet Union? Molotov? Yeah, you're right, but now for extra credit. <laughs> what was his first name? Who here? Thank you. Right back there. Right back there. What is your name, sir? My name is not Vyacheslav. All right. Congratulations. That's good. All right. So at this Berlin conference, they agreed to call a, a wider conference for two separate purposes. The first purpose was to settle the Korean War, which had just ended. And the second purpose was to try to resolve the French uh, war with the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. The word democratic is a title, not a description. Uh, and uh, April 26 was the start of the Korean War portion of the conference. Uh, so it started on April 26, and it ended shortly thereafter with nothing happening. And you know what? Nothing's happened with that since. I think we still just have an armistice in place in Korea. They've never uh, reached a peace settlement. And May 8th was the start of the conference on uh, trying to resolve the French uh, war to keep their colony. Uh, and May 8th's an important date. Anybody remember what it's the day after? I know, May 7th. But <laughs> what, happened, what happened on May 7th? DMV and Fu. So just picture Georges Bidot showing up the day after at the negotiating table. You can imagine what kind of, uh, what kind of power he had at the table. And, and you know what? As it turns out, it turned out pretty well for France. So let's look at the principal players because this was uh, really a brand new ball game. Uh, the, the big four foreign ministers that you saw were all you know, World War II types. But now we're going to see some new players. Over our, when I say vehement, screaming objections, uh, the other ministers invited Zhou Enlai of China, which was really a coming out party <coughs> for him because they had only taken over China. That is, Mao and the communists uh, had taken over China at the end of 49. Uh, here we are uh, in May of 54. This is really a coming out party for the Chinese. Now, I picked this picture of Zhou Enlai for a very particular reason. Let me. So the question is, who had he been watching on TV and practicing for this moment? No. It's Queen Elizabeth right here, right here. That's the royal wave, the thumb, the flat hand. There it is, right there, you got it. Believe me, he'd been practicing. This did not, no Chinese person of that generation knew anything about that. And here's Bidou on the left, Eden in the middle, and Dulles uh, on the right. You can see, that it's perfect. Dulles is happy, Eden is quizzical, and George Bidou looks, <laughs> well, I'm not gonna say what he looks like. He was dealt a rough hand, a rough hand. And we'll, we'll take a look at uh, how they did. Now, here's something that's really quite remarkable. Dulles had started out as a lawyer, and as a junior associate at what was then the finest law firm in the country, Sullivan and Cromwell in New York, and ended up as the senior managing partner uh, of Sullivan and Cromwell, which was no small achievement. And he's accepted, he got involved in politics and he's accepted a role as Eisenhower's chief diplomat, right? That's his job. He so loathed the communists that it, he didn't just say, I'm not gonna talk to them. No American diplomat is gonna talk to them. Now they're going to a peace conference, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? He refused to shake hands with Joe and Lai at a diplomatic reception. Joe comes up, puts out his hand, turns on his back. Well, he was so upset at it being not just in the same room or the same building. Dulles was so upset at being in the same city 
He went home in a huff on May 3rd, and it was a good thing he did, because he left Walter Bedell Smith, his deputy, in charge. And that was a good thing, because Walter Bedell Smith, who was Ike's former chief of staff, uh, was, oh, here he is on the right. Uh, he's got his notebook, right, taking notes. After leaving the army, he was Truman's ambassador to Russia. He was CIA director and then became assistant secretary of state. These are big, big jobs because he was uh, really one of the unsung heroes of the middle of the century. He was superb at cleaning up other people's messes. Yes, sir. The other foreign ministers. And so it was a four to one vote? I mean, is, is that what happened? Yes. Yes. And who were we at that point? We had, they could have done this without inviting us, right? Uh, we were the big kahuna, but in Vietnam, we were nobody. I only wish it had stayed that way. <laughs> Another key player, of course, is from the uh, Ho Chi Minh's Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Pham Van Dong, who became very well known to the West. Uh, and you can tell, if you look very closely, that May 8th was the first day he had ever dressed in Western clothes. Somebody else picked them out for him, uh, and they weren't exactly sure of his size. And from the uh, uh, state of Vietnam, which was uh, Emperor Bao Dai's uh, government that the French had set up and tried to establish as the government for all of Vietnam, uh, a very sophisticated guy because in order to work closely with uh, Bao Dai, you had to spend a lot of time in Paris and the Riviera. So you're looking at a very sophisticated guy. And later in the conference, uh, he would be replaced because uh, uh, Bao Dai appointed, right in the middle of the conference, appointed uh, Noel uh, Din Ziem as his new prime minister, which he would live to regret. I'm talking about Bao Dai would live to regret him. Uh, by the way, I've been trying to learn how to pronounce things like NGO. I'm going to pronounce it no, but the way you should pronounce it is take the word sing, S I N G. Now drop the S and the I. Ng. That's how you're supposed to pronounce it. I can't do it. So I'm just going to say, I'm just going to say, no, din ziem. Now, there's two ways to, the, the French, by the way, in the 1880s, wrote a uh, Western alphabet for the Vietnamese language. Uh, and they didn't do a bad job, but there's two Ds. One D looks like this one, uh, but uh, that's incorrect for his name. There's another D where there's a bar across the vertical, the left vertical of the D. If you put a bar across it, you pronounce it Ziem. And that's, in fact, his first name. And of course, we say uh, Mr. Ziem because we don't understand that that's actually his first name. His family name is No Go. No. So who is, this is Ziem right here. Uh, son and grandson of an imperial Mandarin, Catholic, anti-French and anti-communist, but he, he specialized in white suits. Uh, no joke, he really did, and we'll see more of that. And here's Bao Dai, uh, the emperor, brought out of uh, some French uh, casino by the French, and he, uh, but he's legitimate. He, remember all the emperors we looked at? He's the direct lineal descendant. Uh, of the ones we looked at. Uh, but the French set him up uh, and just said, oh, this is the real government. You know, everybody bowed down, but not a lot of people did. And he ruled from the French Riviera. <laughs> and then in the middle of the conference, the French government decides it's time to get real. And they recognize Vietnam as a fully independent and sovereign state. When I say too little, too late, you have to ask, how late was it? <laughs> I'll tell you. I will tell you. Less than two weeks later, the French government fell. <laughs> Goodbye. Gone. That's too little, too late. <clears throat> and on June 20, Pierre Mendes France uh, 
who was the head of the Radical Party, uh, became the Prime Minister, and he appointed himself Foreign Minister and said, I'm going to Vietnam. Now, don't be misled, I think I've said this before, don't be misled by the word radical. It was a center, maybe center-left party, like the Democratic Party here, uh, and it had uh, adherence from the educated classes in France, the upper middle class, uh, uh, the professional classes. And, um, you know, he made an incredible statement for a man first achieving high office. I'm going to do what nobody else has been able to do. I'm going to solve the whole Vietnam issue in 30 days or I'll resign. And he said that loud and clear publicly. Here he is, uh, Jewish, which is quite remarkable given that the Dreyfus affair uh, was less than a half a century behind him. Uh, very widely respected, uh, partly, partly because he was a su superb uh, politician, but perhaps more because he had a superb record in World War II. And as you know, there weren't that many Frenchmen who could say that with a straight face. He could. Uh, a resistance fighter in the French underground, captured, escaped, got to London, uh, joined the Free French under de Gaulle, uh, volunteered for the Air Force, which was not an uh, insurable event. Uh, in those days, uh, just a fine, fine politician of genuine integrity. But talk about high stakes poker. I mean, 30 days to solve a nine year old war. Well, to show you what a superb politician he was, before he went to, to uh, Geneva, he got off the plane in Bern. Am I saying that right? Bern, yes. Switzerland for a little behind-the-scenes meeting with the fellow that he regarded as the true power player. Not Ho Chi Minh, but Zhou Enlai. And, of course, he was correct because by that time, uh, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam was on the balls of its ass. There is no other way for it. We're going to see how that played out because they were, well, we'll see in just a moment. Uh, without Chinese help, they would have collapsed by that time, by that time. And he had, uh, he had another problem in terms of looking at the cards in his hand. A very senior uh, French general with a distinguished uh, war record uh, was sent by the French cabinet to, in preparation for the conference to do a flying tour of Indochina. And he came back and told the French cabinet, we got to get out of this. Our people are about to collapse. Morale is terrible uh, after DMB and Fu. Uh, we're just in trouble. We need to get out. And uh, when he said that, uh, people believed him in, in Paris. He feared a total collapse, uh, which he expected was going to happen very shortly. Here he is under the blue arrow, second from the left. That's Matthew Ridgway on the right, who had a very distinguished career in World War II. Arthur Radford, Admiral Arthur Radford on the right, and that's Engine Charlie Wilson in the suit. The man who said what's good for General Motors is good for the country, and when he said it, it was probably true. <laughs> nobody, likes, nobody likes to admit that, but it was probably true. When he came back and made that report, it lit a fire under the French, and he said that despite the fact that at that moment, there were more French soldiers in Vietnam than there were uh, in the Viet Minh. They still controlled half of the country and uh, all the major cities and ports. But uh, being a successful military operation uh, is often all about morale. And morale in the French forces after Dien Bien Phu was on a scale of 1 to 10, like a minus 12. Uh, and that's what he realized when he went across. Nobody in the French military, especially the officers, thought there was any hope left. Despite the fact that if you just looked at the situation on paper, you'd say, oh, the French army is in great shape. But that's not what he reported. Unknown to them, General Giap had done the same thing with the Viet Minh and had concluded that 
Diem Bien Phu and the effort that his people had made had so exhausted his people and he had suffered gargantuan casualties that his forces were about to collapse. Right? And he made, he was very explicit. That's a quote. The present balance of forces does not favor us. He was very afraid that his own army was about to collapse. So we can say that discontinuities in perception favor success in negotiating agreements. All right? Who said that? Thank you very much. I said that. Right there, he knew. <laughs> So here we have the Soviet, Soviet foreign minister, uh, and he's pressuring uh, uh, Ho, because he went to, uh, he went to uh, North Vietnam before he went to the conference. He's pressuring him, and this is a rough guy. This is not Anthony Eden, you know, Mr. Suave, Mr. Svelte. This is a very rough, tough guy, but I'm about to show you a picture that shows you no matter how tough you are, there's always somebody tougher. Don't be misled by the funny shape of this. You'll see why in a minute. Stalin had had, and we didn't understand this. We truly did not understand it. Stalin couldn't have cared less about Southeast Asia. Just didn't care. Uh, but he had died a year before, and his successors had decided that uh, given the balance of forces in the world, it would be smart to uh, have some detente to allow the Soviets to rebuild their nation, which had been so badly battered during World War II. And even before the conference, Molotov was urging Ho to agree to a division of the country into North and South. He was already talking about the 16th parallel. That wasn't the final decision, but it was pretty darn close. And now I'm going to show you the picture that I love. Here's Molotov with just a friendly little pat on the shoulder, right? You can imagine what it's like to have a mass murderer, a mass murderer put his friend there. But what you really have to look at it, that's not a friendly pat, my friends. That, those fingers are digging into his shoulder. There is a message being sent there by a good old uh, killer Stalin. And in the meantime, what were the Chinese up to? Oh, ho, ho. there's Zhou Enlai on the left, but who's that kid on the right? That's Mao Zedong, 10 years earlier. <coughs> when I first saw that picture, I didn't know who it was. Right? Because we're accustomed to this kind of look, where he gained a little weight when he, he got out of the caves of Yan'an, the Yan'an caves, and came into Beijing and got three square meals a day. Uh, and they put enormous pressure, I mean enormous pressure, uh, on the um, uh, Ho Chi Minh government, the Democratic Republic of <coughs> Vietnam, the DRV. And we're going to look at why. Because they had just spent three years experiencing what it, like, what it felt like to, to face the American military in Korea. And they didn't like that feeling. Despite the fact that it had ended in a draw, they didn't feel like they had won. And they were darn tootin' afraid that we were going to go into Vietnam uh, if there wasn't a quick settlement. And they also wanted to separate out Laos and Cambodia, which, remember, under France, uh, the three countries, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, had been Indochina. Uh, but they thought that if they could separate out Vietnam from the other two, they would have a lot of influence in Cambodia and Laos. Uh, and most of all, they wanted to show in this very public international conference that now it wasn't the big four anymore, it was the big five. And they were very, very intent on that. That was extremely important to them because they were brand new on the world scene. This was the first big conference uh, that they had uh, uh, participated in. In fact, as it turned out, you could argue that it was still the big four, but France was no longer in the big <laughs> category. That's an argument. You, you could go either way with that. And how did, he, how did he persuade them? 
Well, as I said earlier, by 1954, they were the chief supplier to the DRV, and they were so uh, critical to the DRV's economic uh, existence and military existence that they could, by subtly threatening uh, to withhold aid, have an enormous influence. They were training literally tens of thousands of uh, North Vietnamese soldiers, uh, both at the troop level and at, especially at the officer level. And Zhou himself was just incredibly skillful. And uh, uh, he went on from this conference to many, many others over the next 15 years uh, to demonstrate, regardless of whether you like him or like his government, whether you agree with any of his policies, has nothing to do with that. He was just, what I'm focusing on is that he became uh, incredibly skillful. Uh, and an, an example of the kind of pressure that the Chinese Party Central Committee sent uh, their uh, counterpart in Vietnam, this uh, uh, telegram just before the conference started, if Vietnam wants to have a cessation of hostilities, meaning Ho's government, it's ideal to have a relatively permanent demarcation line that can safeguard the whole region. In reality, the cessation of hostilities today may become permanent, uh, uh, di uh, dividing the country into two parts tomorrow. And the demarcation line should go further south. Uh, it could be the 16th parallel, close quote, because there had already been discussions about whether there should be a line drawn, whether it should be permanent or temporary. And Ho's government was saying, well, it should be temporary and it should be the 13th parallel. The numbers get higher as you go further north from the equator. So the 13th parallel would have meant the line would be closer to the Saigon end of things in the south. Uh, the 16th parallel is further north, and of course the 17th parallel is even further north. So then we have uh, the British Foreign Secretary, Anthony Eden. Look at this lovely, sweet smile. Uh, you can see it on uh, Secretary Eden, and uh, it looks like if you look at the, if you look at the smile lines here, uh, two guys who, you know, special relationship, allies, close buddies, yeah, you bet. They loathed each other. <laughs> Good tales. What? Good tales. Well, we're going to see that. Have you seen this? <laughs> Did you come over to my house and see this? You can see how well tailored Eden is. Yes, right? This is 1954. He and his prime minister, Winston Churchill, who came back from the dead, remember, he had been voted out of office just after uh, helping to win World War II, but he came back at the age of about 137 to uh, resume the uh, prime ministership at exactly the moment that Eden believed was his moment in the sun. And out comes from the closet, wound up, you know, this ancient Winston Churchill. Uh, and they honestly believed that they were, their policy was uh, the ultimately helpful policy to France. They were gonna get France out of their quagmire, out of France's quagmire in Vietnam. And the, they used the word quagmire, and uh, Dulles was not paying attention. Uh, the U.S. government, maybe, they, maybe the U.S. government didn't have that word in the U.S. dictionary. Well, he uh, left him because he was with the communists. Ah, yes. So here's a better picture of Churchill and, um, and Eden together. This is at the end of World War II, you can see uh, Winnie is still skinny, and I don't know if you can see it. Let me, let me see. Oh, uh, you can't see it. This is Eden in a, in a double-breasted suit uh, that clearly uh, was made by the worst tailor in London, probably during the Blitz. You can see that the suit doesn't fit at all, but unfortunately, uh, in this lighting, you can't see it. So one of my better jokes is gone. And uh, the Americans had, before the conference began, had been trying to uh, get all the Western allies, the World War II Western allies, together on, uh, behind a policy of, we'll take over from France. 
France, what do they know, right? We'll take over the winners of World War II. We will make this happen. Winston Churchill, this is his word, thought it was lunacy. That's his word, not mine. And through enormous patience and persuasion, Eden kept the conference going. And when I say the Americans uh, tried to scuttle it, you'll see why in a minute. Eden also wanted a uh, successful conference to sort of build up his reputation so that he would succeed Churchill as prime minister. And uh, you all know that it's sometimes not so wonderful to get what you wished for. Yeah. He got what he wished for and he lived to regret it because two years later, uh, came just one of the worst moments in modern British history. Would I be right in saying the worst moment in modern British history? Yeah. And Eaton, of course, was uh, Churchill's son-in-law. Did that help or hurt? <laughs> I don't know. That's interesting, though. I'd forgotten that. You're 100% right. So here's the Americans, Ike and Dulles. They are reading a policy or position paper what you've got to get through your heads is that Ike was an incredibly smart guy. He was not an intellectual, but he was incredibly smart. He didn't end up as the supreme uh, military commander of the Western Allies in World War II by accident. But as president, he didn't uh, show off with the kind of intellectual wit of a Kennedy. He uh, didn't have a great uh, speaking presence. But his grasp of foreign affairs and of international relations was superb, which is why I fault him for what he allowed to happen. <coughs> Their policy changed several times just during the space of the conference. But the first half, they were actually trying to persuade France to keep fighting. After DNB and Fu, you know, after General Eli's report, they're still trying to convince the French that it just keep on fighting. Nine years isn't enough. Then they tried to persuade the Brits to organize this World War II alliance to reass reassert itself and take over from uh, France. Why? To prevent. Vietnam from going communist, a country that had no strategic importance to anybody uh, in Europe or the United States, except possibly France, who had already decided we want out of here. Remember the 7% solution? Remember last week uh, that uh, uh, the uh, vote, the, the poll in France for supporting continuation of the war? 7%. Seven, and that was before DMB and food. <laughs> Eden said, no way. And Dulles, this is our chief diplomat. Dulles went behind uh, Eden's back to a Commonwealth country, Australia, and tried to persuade them to forget about the Brits. Uh, you just come with us. Uh, such a sophomoric, uh, really a juvenile kind of thing to do. Uh, and then the Americans changed position again. And here, it may not be justifiable, but it's understandable. This guy, Senator Nolan of California, and his many, many, many colleagues on the right uh, were putting enormous pressure on their own party, the Republicans, uh, to not just oppose communism in terms of expansion, but to roll it back in particular Eastern Europe, all the satellite countries of Eastern Europe, we should sort of start World War III and roll it back. Uh, and you really have to understand how widespread uh, this was uh, because remember in those days, half of the Democratic Party, all those nice southern racists in the south, they were Democrats. They were just as uh, virulently anti-communist uh, it's no wonder that uh, after the Civil Rights Acts were passed that they all migrated to the Republican Party. It was their natural home all along. Uh, and by the way, I'm not making any moral judgments about any of these folks. I'm just reporting the facts. Uh, but you have, look at this. This I have never seen 
a picture of Eisenhower like this. Right? Just look at that look. And he had, a, uh, had to deal with a politics that make the Tea Party today look like uh, small potatoes. These were powerful people who uh, didn't think twice about telling uh, Eisenhower where to get off. Eisenhower's mother was a Quaker. Yes. <laughs> uh, actually, not a Quaker. She was a river Christian in Kansas. It was a sect of Christianity that's kind of interesting. And that's for another day. Uh, so the only way to roll back the Viet Minh, of course, is to put boots on the ground. Ah. Hey, do you get full value here? You want boots on the ground? You got boots on the ground. So here's Ike and his whole cabinet, and they literally, both the cabinet as a whole and then the National Security Council in smaller meetings, had meeting after meeting after meeting because the American public's reaction to the Korean War was overwhelming. <coughs> they, uh, whether they were right or wrong, I'm only reporting what the facts were. The opinion polls were overwhelming that the American public didn't want any more Koreas. We had fought World War I to save the world from democracy. We had fought World War II to save ourselves from uh, the Nazis. And they didn't understand why we had uh, fought the Korean War. Uh, the public as a whole, and it was a bloody, awful, vicious fight. Uh, Korean War veterans came home in terrible shape. And the American public said, no, 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 no. This is enough. They didn't want any more wars. Uh, and then, yet they had to deal with the Republican and Democratic right wing that are saying, we want to roll back communism. And, and this was the phrase that I'm sure you've heard. We mustn't lose another con uh, country to communism. As if, it, as if we owned it, you know? It's like, don't lose any more cash, you know? Uh, the, the arrogance of it is overwhelming. When, under McCarthy, when they said, you know, we lost China, somebody pointed out, you can't lose a country which at the time had 500 million people. <laughs> we know yours. exactly where it is. It's yes. not yours to lose. Right. You can't lose. And, and the, the American situation in the middle of the Geneva Conference had been summed up by Walter Lippmann, who at that time was probably the leading uh, editorial com columnist in the country. The American position at Geneva is an impossible one, so long as leading Republican senators have no terms for peace except unconditional surrender of the enemy and no terms for entering the war except as a collective action in which nobody is now willing to engage. In other words, our posture at the conference wasn't just impossible, it was ridiculous. We didn't have a strategy that was viable. Talk about being uh, between a rock and a hard place? Yes, that's between a rock and a hard place. Because at exactly, and I mean exactly, during the weeks of the Geneva Conference, the Army McCarthy hearings were going on, and, and this is the first time, one of the first times, that you're seeing something like that broadcast on television across the country. There were televisions in every hardware store on every little main street of the United States with people crowding around to see it. And uh, uh, do you all know, I'm sure you do, you all know who this is? Give me his name. Welch, right? And who does he represent? He represents the private. He represents the private in the army. I can't remember his name. Actually, he represented, uh, during this phase, the secretary of the army. But you're not wrong, he also represented him. And now for the $64,000 question. What was his law firm? Thank you. Right here. Right here. Raise your hand so everybody can see. Hale and Dorr. Hale and Dorr. Boston. Of course, Boston. Yes. So the Ike and his White House political staff were also totally, and I, can't, I cannot emphasize this enough, totally focused 
on the November 54 congressional elections. Remember the big picture I showed you of his cabinet? Mm -hmm. There were probably only two or three people around that table who could have picked out Vietnam on the map. <laughs> this they were focused on because they had, the Republicans just two years earlier had won control when Eisenhower's landslide swept the country. They had won control of both houses of Congress for the first time since the 1920s. All right, this was no minor event for the Republican Party. And, they, and, the, and the Eisenhower administration could not reconcile no more careers, Koreas, with no more communist takeovers. So they came up with the ultimate diplomatic strategy, break up the conference. I, I, I am not joking. This is Dulles at his finest. By the way, Dulles was a lot smarter than me, a lot more experienced than me, a true patriot, and an idiot. <laughs> but it's easy, it's easy for me to say that 65 years later. Of course, we're sitting here all comfy uh, with all of this uh, time passed uh, because, you know, if you had asked me in 1954 what I thought, well, I was 10 years old in 1954. And this was no minor thing. He gave official instructions to Walter Bedell Smith to break the conference up, to go in there and just blow it apart. Bedell Smith was not just reluctant. He had a private meeting with Anthony Eden and told him what his instructions were. Let's stop and think about that for a minute. A man who wasn't worried about his next paycheck or whether he kept his job. He, Walter Bedell Smith was worried about doing the right thing. Anthony Eden proved extremely adept and kept the conference going. Molotov and Joe and I continue to, to put enormous pressure on the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Fresh proposals were made and, and the whole conference moved forward because they all understood that this July 20 deadline that Mendes France had set, you know, we were either going to have an agreement by July 20 or I resign. They believed him. Nobody doubted that Mendes France was out of there if he didn't get his uh, agreement. And they all understood that there would be chaos if they didn't have an agreement. But it, on June 17, there was this watershed event that wasn't perceived as an event at all, never mind a watershed event. But 65 years later, when we look back, it was literally, and I'm using a metaphor that you all know, it was the nose of the camel sneaking in under the tent. It was an incredible change that was done absolutely casually. Ike and his closest advisors, oh, see, I told you it was a watershed event. <laughs> hey, you're arguing with me, and there it is. You can't argue with the picture. It's a watershed event. Frederick Lojeval, who is the uh, leading historian of uh, the Vietnam War, <laughs> says based on uh, the, the kinds of State Department documents, archives that are released after 50 years, and then remember it takes a while for people to read them, to absorb them, to make analyses, to publish books about them. He says, and what he's talking about, and what you'll see in a minute, he's talking about handwritten notes by people at these meetings of the National Security Council and of the cabinet. Handwritten notes taken during these meetings. So Ike and Dulles uh, reached agreement on that date that the United States would probably have to first let the French leave. Let the French leave. The troops are already trudging over to the, 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 the ships in Haiphong and we're going to let them leave. Permit a north-south split, which the state of Vietnam, uh, the Bao Dai uh, Diem regime, was absolutely opposed to. And here is the watershed event that they would probably have to take over responsibility for the defense of the southern half of Vietnam mm. and possibly for all of Southeast Asia. 
And, yes, sir. Yeah, how does the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization fit into all of this? That was, that was Dulles's response to the final accords of the Geneva Conference. He ran around afterwards and tried to put the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, CETO, in place as an analog in Southeast Asia to NATO in Europe. Uh, and it was partially successful for about 15 minutes. I, that's an unfair statement on my part. <laughs> At least 20 minutes, you're exactly right. But this is really amazing. It took uh, sometime in 2004, 5, 6, 7 for these handwritten <coughs> notes to be declassified and released. Stacy, at this time, was the domino theory? You've seen this. I can't oh. believe it. I can't. Will you please come up here and do this lecture for me? Come on, come on. The die was cast. And if you don't believe me, <laughs> but here's the key, and this is where I fault Eisenhower. And I'm a big, you know, I'm a big admirer of Eisenhower, for those of you who took my course on Eisenhower. Yes. They cast that die for 99.9% .9 domestic political reasons, unrelated to any fundamental strategic interest the US, U.S. had in Vietnam. And how do I know that it was unrelated to any strategic interest we had in Vietnam? Because we had none. <laughs> zero. Maybe less than zero. It was a country, as much as I'm you know, focused on it, and as much as I admire uh, some of the Vietnamese, and as much as I'd like to go to Vietnam as a visitor, it was of no consequence to the United States in 1954. But it, it, if, you, if we were positioned in the mindset in 54 of, of trying to prevent the spread of uh, evil communism, uh, it certainly uh, was, a, was a, it had some significance vis-a-vis -vis China's uh, lusting after Indochina. Yeah, and you, what you're reflecting is exactly the way uh, both Republican and Democratic leaders uh, talked about it, uh, but I'm talking uh, on a different level, and you could easily say, uh, Wallach, you don't know what you're talking about. Are you really arguing with all of the political leaders of the time? Yes, I am. <laughs> because uh, you could argue, I think with a lot of validity, that a China going communist was a strategic blow for the United States. I could make that argument very comfortably because it was a huge country with a lot of people uh, that was bound to have uh, ultimately a huge role in the world. I make that argument, but at that time, Vietnam, I don't mean this in any disrespect <coughs> to the Vietnamese people. Obviously, I'm fascinated by them, but as a country, it was meaningless. It was absolutely meaningless. Very backward people, very non-existent economy. To say a third world country, it was a 12th world country. It didn't matter. And particularly to the things that we were interested in. But you, just now, correctly and perfectly summarized the view of every American political leader of that generation. And you're too young for that. You must have been about <laughs> six years old. They couldn't resist pressure from their own right wing. But here's where I fault Eisenhower. He thought that he could not resist the pressure. Eisenhower, remember, had not been involved in politics prior to 1952. And I mean February of 1952 when he was approached about running for the presidency. Up until that time, he had been in the military. He had never voted. He had, had no, uh, he was approached by both the Democrats and the Republicans. They both thought it was equally plausible that he could be their standard bearer in 52. He had no understanding of how popular he was in the country, how he had enormous respect that could translate into political power. He, he would meet guys like Senator Nolan from California and he would think he had to pay attention. 
He could have swept them aside, but he didn't realize his own political power. And the worst was when uh, in the 52 presidential campaign, McCarthy was attacking Eisenhower's mentor, General Marshall, as a communist puppy. And he went, uh, Eisenhower went on a campaign trip to Wisconsin, uh, and in his notes for his speech, uh, he was going to lash out at anybody who attacked Marshall uh, because he knew in his heart and in his head that Marshall was one of the great Americans of the 20th century. And his political advisors talked him out of it. Uh, and, and it was a terrible uh, moral failing on Eisenhower's part. We've got to keep going. They were not motivated when they put their nose under the tent. They were not motivated by anything to do with Vietnam. They were motivated by avoiding the stigma of losing another country to the communists. Stacy, I thought at that time that after Diem Bien Phu fell, that uh, I asked his military advisors, should we go in and you know, replace the French? And Matthew Ridgway said, well, it's going to cost us 50,000 men. Ten million dollars a year, and eventually we'll have to go home. And he said, "Thanks, we won't go." Home. That's exactly right. Uh, last week uh, we talked about the fact that uh, Ike and his advisors actually discussed, and again, we now have the notes of their meetings, lending the French before the Fu nuclear bombs, nuclear bombs, and there was one meeting at which, according to the notes of everybody there. The only person in the room opposed to it was Ike. Uh, but you're 100% correct. Uh, Ridgway uh, not only was opposed to it, he was, uh, I hope I pronounced this correctly, prescient. Am I saying it right? Prescient. Uh, and amazingly enough, despite the fact that over the years since they've gotten a lot of bad press, the CIA was remarkably prescient uh, for the next 20 years in their analysis. Mm -hmm. So they couldn't bear the risk uh, of both Democrats and Republicans attacking them for being soft on communism. And this was no minor thing. Uh, th this is, these are comic books on the left, you know? Comic books. This is all over the country. And although it's out of sync in time, uh, this wanted for treason <coughs> which obviously was, uh, well, I'll tell you when it was. It was circulated on the streets of Dallas in November 1963. The right wing, the anti-communist, uh, I won't even call them right wing because I don't think that communicates it accurately. The anti-communist cult in this country from 45 to 65 or 70, was uh, a very powerful movement, and it still has a lot of adherence. There are people out in the country today who now that they can no longer deny that the Soviet Union doesn't exist, are searching around for another substitute to regard as an existential threat. I mean, we're all sitting here in the Berkshires on a lovely fall day, and I'm guessing I'm guessing that most of the people in this room don't feel under an immediate threat of being wiped out. But there are people between the Alleghenies, Appalachians in the east, and the Rockies in the west who do feel that. And don't be misled by my tone of voice. Uh, those people uh, include a lot of educated people who would sit here and think that I am nuts, that I don't get it, that, that uh, whether it's ISIS or the communists, we are under, you know, we could be wiped out tomorrow. And this is when the domino theory uh, came to the fore. Uh, the claim that if one country in a region went communist, the rest of them would too. Oh, see, you can't argue with me. There it is. There it is. And Eisenhower, of all people, on April 7, uh, just a, a, a month before the conference began, said you have a row of dominoes set up and you knock over the first one, and what will happen to the last one is the certainty that it will go over very quickly 
The loss of Indochina will cause the fall of Southeast Asia like a set of dominoes. What's particularly upsetting about it is that Eisenhower didn't believe that. He said it, but in his private notes, he knew that it wasn't so. And neither then nor for the next 20 years, uh, nobody at the most senior levels of the government who had direct access to CIA reports and to the military intelligence believed the domino theory. And there was a very simple reason why they didn't believe it, because it, it wasn't true. Uh, you could say, well, wait a minute. <coughs> Uh, after Vietnam turned communist, uh, Laos went communist. Remember I said uh, Vietnam in 1954 was a 12th world country? Laos wasn't a country. It was a space on the map. It had no significance at all. But here's the thing. It went communist before Vietnam did. So which, which domino went which way? The, uh, you would, you would have a lot of trouble going around the world between 54 and 74 trying to find a domino that actually made a whole region go under. <coughs> but they parroted it. Everybody in this room has heard of the domino theory. I believed it. That's what I was taught in school, the dominoes. You let one country go, boom, the whole region goes. <coughs> so what did the Geneva Conference accomplish? By the way, there it is. You can see, this is so funny actually. You think any kind of negotiation could occur when people are sitting 50 <laughs> yards apart? They might as well have been sitting on the sidelines of a football field. But of course, none of the diplomacy happens during these formal meetings. It's all done behind the scenes. That's why when Dulles at a private reception refused to shake Joe and Lai's hand, he was saying, I am not a diplomat, I am an ass. And he went home. <laughs> so now we're going to discover why the conference ended on two dates. It actually <laughs> ended on July 21. But they said, wait a minute. <laughs> We've got to protect Pierre, our good friend Pierre. <laughs> so they backdated everything to July 20. <laughs> hey, that's the kind of practical skill that a real diplomat has. <laughs> And unfortunately, by any standard, the Accords were a very slapdash job because uh, they really weren't in place until the last few days when people felt that deadline uh, coming up, which, by the way, in my experience of uh, 40 years of business negotiation is pretty much how a lot of negotiations <laughs> get done. So what did they accomplish? Number one, an immediate ceasefire. Uh, with ceasefires for each of the three countries of uh, Indochina. Now that's serious. That's a major, major step. Uh, uh, and it was put in place immediately. Who was fighting who in Laos and Cam Cambodia? Same people, the French and the, and the Democratic Republic, the Viet Minh. It was the bulk of the shooting was in Vietnam, but it was happening all across Indochina. A provisional military demarcation line uh, running across the 17th parallel, which is just about the middle of Vietnam. Uh, and that was significant, uh, as you'll see in a minute. A three mile wide demilitarized zone, the famous DMZ, which is six miles, since it's three miles on each side. French forces to regroup south, Viet Minh forces to the north, with French troops to depart unmolested. That's a major deal, and that's in fact what happened. They were out, and it took them about a year, a uh, year and a half, and they were out. Now, neither side to join a military alliance or seek military reinforcement. All right, that's, uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that. Establishment of an international control commission, Canada, Poland, and India, to monitor the ceasefire and then in the small print, and all decisions of the ICC have to be unanimous. <laughs> so, they said, so the ICC will be totally ineffective from day one, because if you look, as of 1954, you've got a Soviet satellite uh, country, you've got an American ally, and neutral India. So how are you gonna get unanimity? And here's probably, in some ways, besides the immediate ceasefire, the most important 
provision uh, because they understood that you know, large segments of the Vietnamese population were sympathetic to Ho Chi Minh, large segments were not, and so they decided to have a period of time, almost a year, in which people could vote with their feet. You gotta remember, in 47, which is what, uh, seven years before? 47? Yeah. The British had tried that as they left India and were breaking up India into today's India and Pakistan. And it was a horror. Millions of people died uh, in that. So this was a very brave step. So who signed these accords? By the way, don't say it out loud yet. <clears throat> Think about what's missing. I've just given you all the accords that were signed. Just think about what's missing. You want me to show it to you again? <coughs> Ceasefire, demarcation line at the 17th parallel, DMZ, French forces to regroup south, Viet Minh to the north, neither, to, neither zone to be involved in military reinforcement, the ICC, and almost a year for civilian populations to vote with their feet. All right, so just think it to yourself. Think it to yourself. There is something missing. Okay? And there's a reason why it's missing, because they were in a big rush to make that July 20 deadline. So who signed the accords? France? Oh, yes. They were very happy to sign. The UK? Very happy to sign. <gasps> Ho Chi Minh's government? Yes. The People's Republic of China and the Soviet Union. You notice somebody missing? <laughs> yes, you do. How many realized that there are two missing signatories? You got it? All right. The state of Vietnam, headed by Emperor Bao Dai and now by Ngo Dinh Diem, who totally rejected any idea of dividing the country in two. Indeed, later Ho Chi Minh would be bitterly criticized for agreeing to the division. But Ho, by this time, is starting to be, uh, in addition to an ardent uh, Leninist, a very practical guy who is looking to try to uh, take his lemon of a conference accord and turn it into lemonade. And of course, the United States, which issued a unilateral statement that it, quote, took note, unquote, of the ceasefire agreements and that it would refrain from either the threat or the use of force to disturb them because uh, everybody at the conference understood that the United States at this point in 1954 was the superpower of the world. Uh, we could easily send uh, air and ground forces into Vietnam if we so chose. In addition, the British delegation issued an unsigned final declaration, unsigned by anybody, issued just by the British, who put out a press release saying that this was, they, could, they felt comfortable doing this because it uh, uh, expressed the consensus of the participants, which was complete baloney. It provided for a general election to be held no later than July of 56. You all knew that that's what was missing? Yes, of course you, of course you do, you knew that. Uh, under the supervision of the newly created ICC to recreate a unified Vietnamese state. An unsigned declaration, but no specifics as to how this was to be done. Remember I used the word slapdash? The reason was they had this deadline and they couldn't figure it out. They couldn't reach agreement about how it should be done. And by the way, uh, that was no easy task. That was no easy task, but they had this deadline. So the only conference participant who actually agreed to hold elections in Vietnam was Tony Eden. <laughs> it was his agreement. He, he wrote it, he did, he wrote it himself, issued it himself, and declared that this was the consensus view, which is just <laughs> enormously funny and tragic at one and the same time. So this final declaration uh, also stated that the conference recognizes, the conference, not Tony Eden, the conference recognizes that the essential purpose of the agreement 
is to settle military questions, and the demarcation line is provisional and should not in any way be interpreted as constituting a political or territorial <coughs> boundary. And um, both the government of Ho Chi Minh and the government of Bao Dai would agree with that. Uh, they were both, uh, well, you gotta remember one thing. Uh, this is so important if you lived through, as an adult, the 60s and 70s. Vietnam has a 2,000 year plus history as one country. It was divided for 20 years. It was divided for 20 years. And it was never intended, as you can see, because in this, Eden was correct. The participants, the Vietnamese themselves, never thought of the demarcation line as anything but a temporary expedient to get the French out of it. Right? And we grew up in the 60s thinking, there's some holy writ that divides the country in two. And a lot of us probably thought it was always that way. And of course, that's baloney. I, I'm the guilty party. I should have known better. So Pierre Mendy's France goes back to Paris in triumph. He's getting the French out of there. And here they are. I, there's a better picture which doesn't have a high enough resolution in which you see the French soldiers getting on, uh, up, going up a gangplank onto the ship. They're grinning from ear to ear. Hey, Mom, I survived. I'm coming home. Uh, yes. And remember, nine years of war. Nine years of war. So Ho Chi Minh and his government were hugely disappointed. Uh, and Ho, as I said, was immediately attacked when he went back to his Politburo and said, this is what we're doing. Uh, it was a very harsh, uh, result after nine years of war and winning at DMV and Fu. Fifty years later, fl flash fool, you got that? Fifty years later, a senior Vietnamese government official had this to say. From a historical point of view, underline the word historical, the agreement truthfully reflected the balance of forces between the parties, meaning all of the parties attending the conference. But guess what the rest of that sentence is? We couldn't re achieve greater results because China and the Soviet Union, our two main supporters, you know, wanted detente with the West. There is a word for that. The greatest impact of the Geneva Accords, besides the departure of the French troops, was the movement of population from north to south and actually from south to north. Uh, uh, every historian and political scientists agrees that over 900,000 Vietnamese moved from the north to the south. Um, many historians say it's actually over a million because uh, a lot of people weren't counted. Uh, this is an actual photograph of Vietnamese uh, getting on ships, mostly American ships, both civilian and military, uh, and some British ships. Uh, and even though this was not a great happy moment for these Vietnamese who had you know, lived all their lives for generations in the North. This was not a happy moment for them. Relatively speaking, it was pretty orderly. Uh, and who were they? Oh, Catholics, a huge number of Catholics, capitalists, merchants, anti-communists by, uh, you know, by uh, intellectual thing. The people who owned assets, people who owned mines, people who owned uh, anything of capital value, they all saw the handwriting on the wall and they moved. Uh, this, I believe, is a British ship uh, taking on people. And you can see that although it's hordes of people, it's relatively, nobody's getting killed. Uh, and there's going to be an enormous difference about events in the future. Ho immediately started to cheat. Uh, he actually went to his Viet Minh cadres in the south, most of whom, most of whom at this point, had, were born and raised southerners. That's who they were. Uh, and said, you got to leave. You got to go up north because that's the deal we made. And that's, you know, taking them away from their families. That's taking them away from the tombs of their ancestors. That's taking them away from uh, everything that's familiar to them, saying, you got to go north, 
Uh, but don't worry. We're going to have these elections no later than July of 56, and you'll be back because I'm going to win. But he also sec secretly kept a lot of uh, military cadres in place because he was a very practical guy and he had been burnt a couple of times. The elections never occurred. Now, why didn't the elections occur? Well, because the US and ZM didn't want them. And they didn't want them for one very simple reason. They knew that Ho Chi Minh would win. There was never any doubt in their mind that Ho would win. Now, some said the reason he's going to win is he runs a police state up there and he's going to have everybody vote for him or get shot. Well, there is some truth to that. But there is some truth to that. Uh, but it was also true that the CIA was saying yeah, 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 he's going to win in the South, too. Britain and France didn't care anymore. They had other issues. Britain, you can think of, is a fellow there who can tell you what's going on in 56. A couple of other things. Uh, any Hungarian, people of Hungarian descent, uh, you remember a couple of things going on in Hungary in 56? The world was a very busy place. The Soviet Union and China were also very, very busy, but they did complain. Nobody paid attention, but they did complain. And the ICC was useless. Um, there's a gentleman who's a little under the weather, so he couldn't be here, uh, who had some personal experience with the ICC, and he could tell you how useless they were. So what did Ho and his DRV get? That's what they got. And the, the, wor the history of Southeast Asia is very different because those elections weren't held. Yes, sir? What was uh, China issues in 1956? Uh, they were, first of all, they were enormously focused on uh, building up their economy. Uh, second of all, this was the start, uh, the very bare beginnings of what by 58 would be the um, great leap forward, which was a great disaster. I mean, just an ultimate disaster. They had a couple of bad harvests, and it's also the beginning, just the bare beginning that by 58 really erupted of their split with the Soviet Union. Uh, so th there was no united front on the uh, Soviet Chinese side. So instead, Ziem and his brother Nu, Nu is on the right, uh, and Ziem is on the left, they ousted Bao Dai and held, in order to legitimize their palace coup, they decided to hold a referendum in uh, South Vietnam. Uh, and, and there was a real election besides the referendum in which Bao Dai ran against uh, uh, Ziem for the presidency. <laughs> Tell me what kind of election that was. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> That's a powerful statement. He wasn't that popular with the kind of people who voted with their feet, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, there's no question that there were a lot of people in Vietnam uh, who, oh, I got, please forgive me. I got to keep going here so we get through this. This was bizarre beyond belief. There has never been ever in the history of the world an honest election where one guy gets 98%. <laughs> but it was worse. In Saigon, he got 600,000 votes in a city that had only 400,000 voters. It was a joke, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody in the world knew it was a joke except these two guys. This is what Eisenhower and Nixon thought of it. Right? It was absurd. But they just, the two of them, Ike and Dulles, decided to support 
uh, ZM for three simple reasons. <coughs> and they're compelling. First, he was a staunch anti-communist. Second, he was a staunch anti-communist. And third, yeah, he was a staunch anti-communist. That was it. Well, there were actually a few other reasons, important reasons. Because he also had these characteristics. He spoke fluent English. We're going to see why in a minute. That was important. In the United States, at that time, there weren't that many people who spoke fluent Vietnamese. He was a, a Christian in an otherwise largely <coughs> Buddhist country. And to the American political leadership at the time, being a Christian was important. He was an ardent nationalist who opposed a vision of the country. That was the Eisenhower Dulles policy, right? He hadn't uh, collaborated with France and Japan. There were people in uh, Vietnam, Vietnamese, I'm saying, who might have played a leadership role, but they were tainted by either their own collaboration with France uh, or their family's collaboration with France or with Japan. And he appeared to be untainted by Vietnam's institutional corruption. That proved to be false, but that was the appearance. Plus, he was young, vigorous, and he knew how to do American speak. And you'll see why in a minute, because he spent some time in America. And best of all, virtually nobody in the US knew what he actually stood for, which was a huge plus. In short, and he was very, very <laughs> short, he was perfect. <laughs> How short was he? All right, that's unfair. That's truly unfair of me. Even though he's dead, I shouldn't do this. Uh, Ambassador Lodge was 6'6". Six, six. Right. Now, it's true that if I'd stood next to him at 5'8", I would have you know, towered over him. But this is a truly wonderful but unfair photograph. You can see these kinds of editorial commenting in photographs of the New York Times all the time. He'd been a colonial uh, provincial governor for the French very briefly in the early 30s and helped to round up Vietnamese communists. You'll see why. Uh, and put them in the Maison Centrale, which was a huge prison in downtown Saigon built by the French in the 1870s. It was finally torn down after the Vietnam War was over. Uh, this is how the French treated political prisoners. That device that they put around their uh, necks is called a kank, C-A-N-Q-U-E. Makes it very difficult, even if you break out of jail, to get very far. Notice the stamp. It's a postcard. French colonial administrators and others would send pictures of this home to France because they thought this was really cute. Uh, and included, you can see others where they're torturing people, and those were turned into postcards. And before you get too high and mighty about it, my fellow Americans, that's what Southerners did with hangings of black men and women in the South. They turned them into postcards and mailed them to their friends across the country. So after criticizing French rule, this is in the early 30s, uh, he decided to resign, which helped him much later. And he then spent the next 20 years unemployed. He lived at home with mom uh, and his brothers and sisters, uh, meditating and uh, having a good time. And politicking. I give him credit for this. Under, you know, this is the French uh, rule. He's politicking, trying to form uh, political networks of supporters. Here's his family. He was very family oriented. Here's ZM. Here's his older brother, uh, the Bishop of Hue. Here's his younger brother, Nu. Here's Nu's wife, the gorgeous Madame Nu, whose name was actually Tran Le Juan, who was the daughter of a very aristocratic uh, Vietnamese family, uh, well-educated. Uh, these are her two older children, her two younger children. Tragically, many years later, both of the older kids in totally unrelated circumstances each died uh, in automobile accidents. Um, what's missing is the older brother, Kiem. Uh, no Din Kiem, because the French um, had been chasing him uh, because he was a political leader and uh, 
He fell into the hands of the Viet Minh, and they killed him by burying him alive. <coughs> in the late 40s, the French focused on his underground political activities, and the Viet Minh did the same, and they both put a price on his head, which goes to show you what it's like to do politicking outside the United States. And uh, on his way to a meeting, he was kidnapped and brought face to face in front of Ho Chi Minh. And uh, we know from North Vietnamese archives, he called Ho a mass murderer to his face, which was the truth. He was a mass murderer. And inexplicably, Ho let him go. It is impossible to explain. And Ho lived to regret it, I'm sure. With the help of that bishop, uh, he moved to the U.S. for four years. He lived in Ossining, New York, uh, just uh, down the street from where I used to live for almost 30 years. Uh, and uh, there's another one just like this. Uh, this is a Marion Old Cemetery. There's a big one in um, Lakewood uh, Township in New Jersey. There are some others across the country. He lived in all of them. Uh, and uh, he spent uh, many hours each day in prayer and meditation, but also in politics. And he developed friends in high places. Uh, the guy on the left is Cardinal Spellman, who at the time, in addition to being New York's cardinal, was a political powerhouse. Uh, and he developed a very intense relationship with him. Senator Mike uh, Mansfield, senior Democratic senator uh, and Catholic, uh, was a big supporter. Uh, Justice Douglas, Associate Justice Douglas, who was a Presbyterian, uh, became a huge supporter of his. And Douglas in addition to being on the Supreme Court, was a very political guy. And maybe his biggest supporter was Henry uh, Luce, the owner of Time Magazine, uh, uh, really the owner of the Time media empire, Time, Life, Sports Illustrated, and Fortune Magazine, plus some newspapers and a TV station. In the mid-50s, Henry Luce was probably the most powerful uh, non-public official in the United States, uh, with Cardinal Spellman, a close second. Uh, Claire Booth Lewis, you, you know about, so. And here he is, uh, April of 55, right at the start. He's already on the cover of Time Magazine, South Vietnam's Zien. The hour is late, the odds are long. But uh, I can tell us at that time, still weren't 100% sure that he was the right guy, mostly because he was so unknown. He was just an unknown quantity. And they actually had made a decision to push him aside and had a telegram prepared to send to Ambassador Lodge to get rid of him. That's what we in America did with foreign leaders we didn't like. We got rid of them. Don't, don't assume any criticism on my part. I'm just reporting the facts. Uh, this is an actual live action photograph. Uh, Saigon and Cholon, the, which originally was a separate town right next door, but when Saigon expanded, Cholon became a neighborhood of Saigon. They actually uh, were controlled by a criminal gang, a mafia. Uh, and that, it was called the Binh Juan. And he took his tiny little army and he uh, blew them away. First, he pushed them out of Saigon into Cholon. He pushed them out of Cholon into the swamps uh, to the west of uh, Saigon. And you're actually seeing uh, his little army uh, who have identified themselves by their little uh, handkerchiefs. But they, they did a good job. They, they knocked them out. They, the French had given up trying to control the Binh Juan. The French said to the Bin Juan, in exchange for not killing French people, why don't you become the police force of Saigon? OK, that's a deal. And one of the reasons that they're here is this is a gambling, gambling and opium, opium den here. Uh, and then he dis then Ziem, uh, destroyed the army of the Ho Hoa Hao. Hoa Hao. Say that fast 62 times, and I'll give you a kiss. It's a shame. I wish I could talk to you more about them. They were fascinating. They were started by this guy, So, uh, and uh, in about 1940. And he, it was Buddhist, but it was uh, 
the essence of it was forget about all pomp and ceremony. We have to focus on making life good for the typical rice farmer, the typical peasant <coughs> or yeoman rice farmer. And we've got to make the religion supportive of that. He was a, a, a guy who believed in virtuous simplicity. And he had a power of effect. Uh, uh, at this time, they had, just in the Delta region, the Mekong Delta region of southern Vietnam, they probably had close to 2 million adherents, 99% of whom were little rice farmers. Uh, they built up an army, and, and a, a male and female army. These are, this is a female contingent. And he went out and knocked the hell out of them, uh, because they were a moderate and moderating force that Xiem didn't want to deal with. He also defeated the private army of the Cao Dai sect. It was likewise very popular in both southern and central Vietnam. Here's a Cao Dai temple. There are a lot of members of the Cao Dai still in Vietnam. And uh, the inside of the temple looks like this. That's the universe. And the eye is the eye of God, keeping watch on you. And they still have many adherents in Vietnam today, with many more living in where else? Of course, Southern California. And uh, you know that persuaded them, Ike and Dulles, to say, "All right, we'll go with this guy. Uh, he's a strong man. We need a strong man." Uh, and uh, so, between '55 and '63, we gave him a lot of money, and a lot of arms, and a lot of political support. And he had. Uh, you know, eight and a half, you can call it nine years of uh, American support to put things together in uh, South Vietnam. He didn't. And we're going to take a quick look at why. First of all, the American left in the 60s said, he's just a puppet, which is what Ho Chi Minh's government said. He's just a puppet. Actually, he was supposed to be a puppet. And he'd probably still be alive today if he'd acted like a puppet, but he didn't. Despite the fact that he was a little pisher, totally dependent on the United States, he didn't pay any attention to us. Constantly uh, either just rejected our advice or said, oh, yeah, 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 and did what he wanted. One of the few Americans, very few Americans he trusted, was a guy we could have a whole course on, Edward Lansdale. Uh, first of the OSS and then the CIA, because with one exception, his principal uh, uh, characteristic was to agree with Xi'an. Whatever you say, Xi'an, that's the right. Oh, that's a man I can rely on. Uh, but he also, uh, because he was a skilled guerrilla fighter, he made his reputation in the Philippines, uh, helped Xi'an uh, destroy the Cao Dai in Hoa Hao. Here he is. He's really a legend. Uh, why do I say a legend? Because he created his own legend. First he did some remarkable things, then he made sure that the guys who wrote the uh, book uh, made it big. He's a very, very super guy. Uh, but he, uh, Xi'an and Nu also had some very unfortunate drawbacks, really unfortunate, that didn't come out right away. Their father had been a senior imperial mandarin and a landlord. They weren't super wealthy. They were upper middle class. They were comfortable. But they identified with the landlord class, not with the tillers of the soil. And it was a deep identification. Uh, and everybody in Vietnam knew that after a while. Uh, and the Buddhist priests of their father and grandfather's era during the rebellion against the French had killed 100 members of his extended family by burying them alive. The lucky ones had their heads cut off. It, and it was a bunch of Buddhist priests. So uh, Ziem and his brother Nu hated the Buddhists. Well, they're 85% of the population. You know, that's a little bit of a drawback. In the late 40s, they murdered his older brother for, for really for no apparent reason. So he had developed such a hatred of communists that he could never sit down and negotiate with them. That's another drawback. And they had, despite the fact that Ziem especially could mouth the right phrases, they really had no understanding of democracy. They, they, didn't, they didn't understand what the process was. 
They preached reform, but rarely carried through. And he never trusted his own military officers. <laughs> this is at least as rational, because uh, several of them several times tried to overthrow him. So he based, and this is just a killer, he based most of his postings and promotions on who was Catholic and who had proven their loyalty to him. Uh, and here you see it live action, folks. Those are two American Skyhawks loaded with American bombs being flown by two American trained Vietnamese Air Force pilots, Mr. Q and Mr. Kwok. You are seeing it live. They are coming in over the Saigon River and seconds later bombing Diem Presidential Palace. And they hit it. One of the bombs landed almost literally in Diem's lap. He's sitting in a chair. The bomb lands here and didn't explode. <laughs> did, but you can see a bunch of others did explode. It's on fire. And the wonder is, here's this, you know, and, and the palace guard, which you're seeing uh, here is the palace guard. And this wonderful soldier, uh, it's so unclear which way he's directing him. Is he part of the palace guard saying, right over here, protect ZM? Or is he saying, go away? <laughs> it's hard to know. It's hard to know. But um, that's for real. That is for real. And you want to know something amazing? The two pilots survived. One of them ended up many years later in the United States, and one ended up becoming an ace pilot for the Vietnamese and getting shot down by the North Vietnamese later in the war. And he had a basic problem. If you disagreed with him on any particular subject, he thought you were a political dissenter. And if you were a political dissenter, you're guilty of treason. That equation, disagreement equals political dissent equals treason. That's a problem for a man trying to create the democratic uh, uh, basis for fighting the Viet Minh. So his key uh, failings by 61, you have enormous concentration of land holdings in the hands of a very few rich people. In the Mekong Delta, less than 1% of landowners owned over 40% of the land. And the Americans came in and pressured him every year he was in power, trying to say, you'll never survive if you don't redistribute the land. And he kept promising. The Catholic Church also owned an enormous amount of land, and he favored them. Uh, and he, he just never carried through. He finally sold some land. Uh, you know, got some of his landlord cronies to sell some of their land, uh, but it was uh, not an effective land reform. Less than 15% of the available arable land was actually redistributed. And in the meantime, Viet Minh cadres are visiting village after village at night and saying, oh, yeah, everybody gets two acres. Uh, here's a deed, and don't worry if they show up during the day and tell you that's not, because we'll show up and we'll enforce these deeds. And here are the enforcers. Yeah, it doesn't look like much, but it was more than enough to deal with GM's army patrols. Uh, and so there you have the two competing forces. And I'm not saying that the GM government was better or worse than the Viet Minh. I'm just saying when it came to land reform, here's some more guys coming. They come at night, redistribute the land, then, you know, his favoritism towards Catholics and the church uh, started to turn the Buddhists, particularly the priests, into a political force against him on a massive scale. Those, those first few uh, demonstrations turn into gargantuan demonstrations. And then, of course, the ultimate public relations device that turned the world against CM. And, uh, he reacted by just getting ever more ingrown. Uh, by 1963, uh, much of, many of the key government posts were held by members of his family. And uh, uh, Tran Le Juan, uh, his sister-in-law, who became, since he was uh, celibate, uh, became the first lady of Vietnam. There was no such title. But she became the official hostess of the government. And she became a power in her own right because uh, she was sort of a Sarah Palin type, but with an enormous temper 
and a huge voice and enormous self-confidence, she'd go around the presidential palace berating anybody who disagreed with her. You're a cabinet minister. This is the way I think it should be done. You're not doing it that way. <coughs> Aren't you going? So despite his attractive qualities and massive amounts of USA, who had DM alienated? Rice farmers, Buddhists, professionals, intellectuals, and students, non-Catholic army officers, and the US military and AID staff. <laughs> so the question is, who's left? Right? Well, that's kind of interesting. His huge family and everybody dependent on his family, Catholics. He maintained enormous support among Catholics, and uh, they were about 10% of the country, and most of them had moved south by that time. The secret police, which knew, organized, and ran very, very efficiently. Landlords, factory owners, mine owners, their employees, suppliers, services, the whole capitalist, or crony capitalist, whatever you want to say, uh, the whole capitalist element of South Vietnam society. Merchants, financiers, brokers, distributors <coughs> making money off the US AID programs, and anti-communists, lots and lots of anti-communists. So there were plenty of people who supported ZM. But then there were three true game changes that occurred in 1960, and now we'll wrap up. Ho Chi Minh, in 1960, retired. I didn't know that. He had been the uh, general secretary of the Communist Party. And he retired and became the chairman emeritus uh, of the uh, North Vietnamese government. Mm -hmm. A southerner, a South Vietnamese, Le Juan, succeeded him as general secretary and began a campaign to push him and Giap aside. So all during the 60s and early 70s, when we thought it was Ho, 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 Ho Chi Minh, it was Le, 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 Le Juan. I didn't know that. <laughs> The government did, but they didn't tell us. And the Politburo in 1960, uh, the DRV Politburo, decided that they had to begin a forcible military campaign to recapture the South. Here they are, Li Juan, Le Juan on the left, and his uh, uh, faithful Indian companion, Tonto. No, 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 no. Le Duc Tho on the right. Uh, and they really ran North Vietnam. Vietnam all during the 60s and 70s. And then what should have been a game changer but wasn't was our, the youngest man in American history became the President of the United States. <laughs> oh, 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 excuse me. There he is, sorry. That's him at his first press conference. He was the youngest man to become President. Uh, and we're going to talk next time about him and Johnson. Thank you. the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College, enjoy learning simply for the love of it. Educational partners Williams College, BCC, Bard College at Simons Rock, and MCLA provide some of our outstanding faculty. Take a class in the arts, history, literature, and so much more. Contact Ali today. Meet new friends. Keep your curiosity alive. <laughs>